Thank you, Mr. Garbage Man, for being a jerk. Boy, I am incredibly late on this, but I don't care. 2016 is over, so better late than ever, I guess. So 2016 has been a very interesting year. For me, it was actually a pretty good year. I met a bunch of my favorite YouTubers at Too Many Games, and my nephew Julian was born. Other really neat things happened too. Nintendo unveiled their newest home console, two of my childhood icons both turned 20 years old, and tons of famous people died. Now, I'm not gonna be one of those people who says that 2016 was the worst year ever, because I don't really think it was. Sure, a lot of terrible stuff happened, and of course the election was just a train wreck. And I'm not just talking about the guy we elected. But look on the bright side, a lot of great movies came out this year. <laughs> How's that for a segue? By the way, if my hair starts poofing up during this video, I just got out of the shower and I use Perp Plus, so, pfft, you know, stuff happens. But anyway, this has actually been a really good year for movies. And since movies are my first love, more so than video games, despite what some of you might believe, I decided it'd be fun to, pfft, ugh, cares. I decided it'd be fun to count down a list of my personal favorite movies from the past 12 months. I haven't seen every movie that came out this year, despite how much I really wanted to, but I managed to put together a list of 10. So. Without further me talking, I don't know what this was, but <laughs> roll with me. These are my top 10 favorite movies from 2016. Before I begin this list, I'd like to give an honorable mention to Moana. I was really excited to see it, especially concerning the directors also gave us The Little Mermaid, The Great Mouse Detective, Hercules, The Princess and the Frog, Treasure Planet, and even my favorite Disney movie of all time, Aladdin. Although Moana didn't quite surpass my expectations, I still thought it was really good. Looking back, I really appreciate the movie more for its visuals and the music and the culture. I actually have quite a few movies on my list that are just like this, but I guess Moana sort of lacked in a few areas that kept it from being on the list. While things like the ending are very clever and nice, the story is kind of predictable and the humor doesn't hit. There's an especially awful Twitter joke that just made me facepalm so hard that I think it left a mark. Um, my name is Mark, it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's, just, it's funny! But things like the animation and the culture are fantastic. I love that Disney is incorporating more diversity into their films, and they pay a lot of respect to the Polynesian heritage. I'm also a big Hamilton fan, so I lost it when I heard that Lin-Manuel Miranda was gonna write songs for the movie. All of them are amazing, except for the shiny song that the crab sings, that one's a bit weird. I guess that's all I really have to say about Moana. It has a little bit of that Disney magic that I've missed for so many years, but doesn't really do enough to make it one of my favorite movies of the year. Still very good though, and I recommend you check it out if you haven't. Am I the only one noticing Disney's been going a little crazy with live action remakes lately? For a while, it seemed like they were announcing a new remake every week, to a point where it stopped being a joke and gave us a deeper look at the greedier side of Disney. And I'm willing to bet that The Jungle Book is what made these popular. Now, that's only the negative side. We're here to look at the positive. The Jungle Book is based on the original Disney film, which itself was based on the Rudyard Kipling book of the same name. I never read the book, nor do I remember that much from the other Disney movie, but most of the original cast of characters is here and accounted for. Mowgli, Baloo, Bagheera, Ka, King Louie, Shere Khan, the whole bunch. And honestly, there's not really that much to this film. The story's kind of forgettable, the villain isn't as interesting as he was in the original movie, and there are just some weird moments that don't really match the tone. We see Mowgli and Baloo singing Bare Necessities, but it's not necessarily a musical number, it's used like the Just Keep Swimming song in Finding Nemo, it's something Baloo hums to himself. But then King Louie suddenly breaks into I Wanna Be Like You, like the movie suddenly decides to be a musical, and it comes right out of nowhere. So why am I listing it as one of my favorite movies of 2016? Well, honestly, I just appreciate it more for the visual effects. The CG is pretty incredible. These are the most realistic looking animals I've seen in a very long time. The backgrounds are equally fantastic. 
Most of the film, if not the entire thing, was shot on a soundstage with blue screens all over, but with the effects work done in this movie, I can't even tell. It's like we're really in Africa. Or India, wherever we're supposed to be. Kudos to the casting director as well. Baloo is a very unpredictable and laid-back kind of character, so Bill Murray fits really well. Scarlett Johansson at first seemed like a random choice for Ka, but her voice does have a seductive quality to it. Mmm, Scarlett Johansson. Oh, wait, am I still recording? Oh, crap. Ben Kingsley plays Bagheera as a timid father figure trying to find the best for Mowgli. And while Shere Khan in this film doesn't hold a candle to the original, from what I remember anyway, Idris Elba's performance is top-notch. The kid who played Mowgli was just amazing. For someone who had to act off of CG puppets, his interactions with them are so believable. But by far, the best casting choice in the entire movie is Christopher Walken as King Louie. I'm an avid Christopher Walken fan, so this was just a delight. <laughs> Keeping that in. He threatens Mowgli. He sings to Mowgli. He gets summoned by a cowbell. Okay, that's actually kind of ridiculous, but listen to him sing and tell me you don't smile at least a bit. Ooby -doo, I wanna be like you. I wanna walk like you. Talk like you too. <laughs> Just love it. I wanna be like you. Ooh, ooh. So, that's The Jungle Book. I was surprised by how much of a technical marvel it was, though I didn't find the story or the characters remarkably interesting, except for King Louie, to an extent. But what they accomplished with the visual effects, I think, makes for some of the best CG in any film I've ever seen. I would still prefer if Disney didn't keep remaking their old films. Tale as old as time. But they gotta make a little more money somehow. Like, Marvel and Lucasfilm weren't enough. So I don't really mind what they did here. The bare necessities of life sure came to me in some way. I wouldn't call myself a die-hard fan of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I only grew up watching commercials for the 4Kids show, but later in life I found myself playing some of the video games, watching bits of the Nickelodeon series, and seeing a couple of the movies. Yes, that even means I've seen the one produced by Michael Bay! I liked it alright. I would have liked to see more of the Turtles, but it still kind of worked as a movie, and William Fitchner just hammed it up like mad. He's rich. Like, stupid rich. His words, not mine. But I hear that most of the hardcore Turtle fans were disappointed with it which probably explains the direction they took for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows. Not to be confused with the 2013 video game of the same name. How do I know this game exists? The thing about this movie is that there's no coherent plot. It's just a series of events that happens one after the other. Shredder breaks out of jail, creates Bebop and Rocksteady, the turtles contemplate whether or not they want to become human, Casey Jones does some stuff with a hockey stick and kind of whines about things, April gets put in a skimpy schoolgirl outfit, Baxter Stockman laughs a lot, the Technodrome appears, Krang has a fight with the turtles, so much stuff happens in this movie! And that can be a big problem for those who aren't entirely familiar with the Ninja Turtle lore. The movie already isn't technically good, but its biggest issue is definitely with the story. It's not a straightforward plot, and there are tons of things that happen in this movie that never go anywhere. Shredder's deal with Krang, Casey Jones wanting to be a detective, the turtles possibly becoming human. That idea is especially interesting. The outcome would be predictable, but it's never been explored in anything Ninja Turtles related before, at least not that I know of. So yeah, it sounds like this movie's really bad, right? Well, yeah, but I wouldn't call it a complete failure. Out of the Shadows was a lot of fun to see in the theater. The acting was pretty good, the effects are well done, the action's pretty creative. It's just a fun movie. It was fun seeing Bebop and Rocksteady. It was fun seeing the turtles goof around and go to a basketball game to shoot spitballs at Vern. It was fun to see Krang and the Technodrome invade New York. And I imagine it was fun for some men to see Megan Fox in a schoolgirl outfit. Not for me, of course, it's clearly pandering. Megan Fox is attractive, but I don't need to be reminded of that in a Ninja Turtle movie. Now if it was Scarlett Johansson, that would be a totally different story. Mmm, Scarlett Johansson. Wait, am I recording again? Ah, I'm recording. Stupid. Ah. So that's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows. Again, no relation to the game. It's not really good, but it's certainly better than the first movie. And it's a lot of fun to boot. If you're a fan of the Ninja Turtles, as well as a bit of mindless entertainment, though really, what's the difference? You might enjoy it enough. I even have this Out of the Shadows poster on my wall from when I went to see the movie in the theater. And wow, look at that Super Nintendo controller on Donatello's wrist. The D-pad is just a
big green circle and the diamond buttons are just button sliders. I guess the artist never played a video game in his life. It just looks bad. Marvel has had quite a good year, haven't they? With their most recent outing, Doctor Strange, they've proven to us once again that they can still give us some really solid films. It's not as strong as some of their other movies, but it's still pretty damn good on its own. The world-famous neurosurgeon Stephen Strange, played by Benedict Cumberbatch, is involved in, admittedly a pretty over-the-top car accident, and is left unable to use his hands. Turning to Eastern medicine leads him to the Ancient One, who teaches him about the mystical arts and the different dimensions and all sorts of magic stuff, and he pretty much needs to stop the bad guys. It's basically the plots of every Marvel movie, but it's the kind of story we like seeing, so that's okay. The film excels in the visuals. These are some of the greatest effects in any movie I've ever seen, let alone Marvel movie. 2016 was pretty much the year of great CGI, to an extent, and Doctor Strange is no exception. What else is great is that the visuals aren't just there to look cool. They create whole new worlds within our own world, and they're even the center of the climax. There's a scene where Strange reverses time to trap one of the villains in a building that rebuilds itself after being destroyed. Stuff like that makes this movie so creative. Then of course, we have Benedict Cumberbatch. Just watching him on Sherlock has showed me how much of an incredible actor he is, and the role of Doctor Strange continues to show him at his best. Even if his American accent is all kinds of obviously fake. He plays him as cocky and arrogant, then shows genuine confusion and wonder when his spirit is pushed out of his body for the first time. He pulls out all the right emotions at all the right times. Doctor Strange is definitely not one of the best entries in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but some of the things it does to stray away from the typical Marvel formula are very commendable. Instead of having a climax where the city's destroyed and monsters come out of a giant portal, in the end, the city is slowly being put back together, and the hero actually goes inside the portal to stop whatever's going on. It's also a bit heavy on the hospital imagery, so if that makes you squeamish, then watch this movie with caution. If you're able to look past that, then Doctor Strange won't blow your mind in any department other than the visuals, which, again, are spectacular. But if you're just looking for a good, fun, solid Marvel movie, this will definitely get the job done. Open your mind. That sounded way creepier than I thought it would. I knew nothing about Deadpool before I went to see this movie. At first I just thought he was Japan's version of Spider-Man. Then I saw the test footage online and I thought, okay, this guy doesn't seem like a typical superhero. And then I saw him on the Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon, where he was voiced by Iran Stoppable and Eric from Boy Meets World. Then I saw the movie, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Deadpool is a mercenary for hire named Wade Wilson, played by Ryan Reynolds. After he's diagnosed with cancer, he goes through an experiment led by Ajax, also known as Francis, where he's given a bunch of mutant chemical stuff until he becomes disfigured and develops an accelerated healing factor that pretty much makes him unkillable. Now his basic goal is to get Francis to make him look like Ryan Reynolds again, quote, screen junkies, until his girlfriend gets in trouble and then he has to go save her, all while making the typical sex and fourth wall jokes you'd expect Deadpool to make. I just hit my wire on my microphone. Boosh. This movie is the perfect example of fans making a difference. Ever since the character's questionable appearance in X-Men Origins Wolverine, fans have been clamoring for a proper Deadpool movie, and their response was so overwhelming that Fox pretty much had no choice but to do what they were told. And they didn't just lazily mush something together for the sake of getting a movie made, they gave Ryan Reynolds and his team the time and effort they needed to really do Deadpool justice. I'm assuming, anyway, knowing Fox, they're kind of unpredictable, so bull. I am so glad that a movie like this exists. In a time where superhero movies are pretty much everywhere, here we have a movie where the main character is talking to the audience, joking about things like how the studio could only afford to give them two X-Men, and basically doing all the things a normal superhero wouldn't do on film. I'm a sucker for fourth wall jokes, and Deadpool had a bunch of them, which made me laugh. And yeah, when we get to the revenge part of the movie, it does sort of play out like a typical revenge story. But since Deadpool was already aware that he was a fictional character, I think it gives him more of a right to point out the cliches, and it makes the fourth wall jokes even funnier, so I don't really mind it. And really, it all just comes down to Ryan Reynolds. This guy pretty much is Deadpool. He's charismatic, intimidating, and downright hilarious. 
there's never part of the film where I look at him and see an actor giving a performance. It's like watching Michael Keaton as Batman, or Christopher Reeve as Superman, or even Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man. He just owns it. I could watch him slaughter innocent people and spit on each of their graves and still love watching him. I'm not saying I want to watch that, but look, bottom line, he's awesome. To quote Max Bialystok from the producers, Deadpool as a movie is shocking, outrageous, insulting, and I loved every minute of it. Some people might be turned off by the amount of blood and gore there is compared to other superhero movies out there, but if they're willing enough to challenge themselves, then I'd say this would be a fun movie to check out, especially if they're a fan of its sense of humor. You can bet that I am super hyped for the sequel. Huh, an original idea. Didn't expect to see one of these here. A lot of you I'm sure will have no idea what I'm talking about right now, and if it hadn't been for the film's leading actor, Green Day frontman Billy Joe Armstrong, I wouldn't have either. The film is about a former punk rocker named Perry White, played by Billy Joe, who's going through a midlife crisis just as he's turning 40 years old. So he decides to have a little fun and rent out an expensive hotel room for the night and throw himself a party. With a plot like this, you may think it's going to be guilty of falling under some cliches, and at first that's what I thought. The hotel owner warns him if he gets in trouble, then he'll call the police, and you think he's going to be all rebellious and stuff, but the film is paced out in a very grounded and realistic way, and it focuses a lot more on what Perry is feeling as he's getting older. He also misses being in a band with his friends, and touring across the country, schmoozing women, playing rock and roll music. So he has to deal with trying to adjust to living a normal life as well. Billy Joe Armstrong plays both sides of his personality almost perfectly. This movie really shows off the best of his acting abilities. He's played some small roles in the past, but this is the first time he's played the lead in a movie, and the role of Perry White was pretty much made for him. Such a good actor. Like, the Ringo of the group, even though he's a front man. Uh, this analogy's not working, never mind. He can be really funny in this movie, too. There's a scene where his friend Gary, played by Fred Armisen, invites a stripper into his room to dance for him, and all he's worried about is if his friends don't put coasters under their drinks. He wants to let loose and have some fun, but he's such a dad that he can't help himself. Billy Joe also wrote some great songs for the film. The title song is one of the nicest sounding songs Billy Joe has written since Wake Me Up When September Ends. It's even on the Revolution Radio album, it's the last song. It's Actually, a nice fitting way to end that album. Works in both contexts. I'm getting off topic, aren't I? All in all, Ordinary World is a very well-written and well-directed film. It has an interesting setup, a good cast, and depicts the struggles of a man trying to keep up with his age in a really unique way. It sort of makes me more proud to be such a big Green Day fan, because if I wasn't, then I wouldn't have heard of such a good movie. I'm not gonna act like it's the greatest movie ever or anything. Can't be if it's number six on my list. But it was a pleasant surprise for me, and I highly recommend you check it out. It's on YouTube for about $15, so give it a watch and see what you're missing. I really like Finding Nemo. It's a very touching movie about the importance of family and a fun adventure that anyone can enjoy. So when I heard about Finding Dory, like most people, I was a bit skeptical. Finding Nemo worked so well on its own that it didn't really seem to offer much material to even warrant a sequel. But knowing Pixar, they wouldn't go about making sequels unless they came up with something clever and creative enough to keep the story going. Which doesn't explain Monsters University, but they found something good with Finding Dory. Our favorite forgetful fish is back, voiced by Ellen DeGeneres, and while searching for her parents, she ends up in a marine biology place where the fish are kept in captivity with the help of Marlin, his son Nemo, an octopus named Hank, and some plot-convenient flashbacks, Dory is willing to do whatever it takes to find her mom and dad. Finding Dory is the kind of sequel that doesn't exactly continue the story, but that's not really a bad thing. There are moments where it borrows a little too much from the first film, like the turtles and such, and it has a couple here-we-go-again moments that I normally don't like in sequels, but those are on like the first 15 minutes or so, and after that is when the film starts following its own path. And like I said, the movie doesn't continue the story from the first one, instead it decides to expand on Dory's character. Her being frustrated with her memory problem was touched upon in the first movie, but it's the main focus here, and I like what they did with it. Not remembering some things can get her in trouble, but the things she can remember could get her out of trouble. Her greatest weakness is her greatest strength, and it makes her a much more interesting character. 
Finding Dory is by no means perfect. The humor can either make me chuckle or get no reaction out of me, even if the comedy doesn't play a huge part. I don't find the new characters to be as funny or interesting as the Pelicans or the Fish Tank Gang, and the plot convenient flashbacks can be a bit too plot convenient. But like many of Pixar's films, particularly the original Finding Nemo, the real strength of the film comes from the heart. Finding Dory has a very strong emotional center, that being Ellen DeGeneres. She completely owns the character of Dory, and you can tell she's been waiting to say these lines for well over 13 years. Every line of dialogue she delivers feels real, and Dory already gets greatly expanded on in terms of her character, so this could really change how people perceive Ellen as an actress. Or she can stick to scaring Taylor Swift in the bathroom. <laughs> so, is Finding Dory as good as the first movie? Well, Finding Nemo was already a hard movie to top, but Pixar sequels don't normally try to be better than their predecessors. Some of them I don't think even try to be good movies. They just expand on the world or continue the story like good sequels should do. And Finding Dory is a good sequel. I definitely wouldn't mind swimming with these fish again. That was terrible. Why did I write that? One of Disney's philosophies as a company seems to be, once we've got our hands on a popular name, milk as much out of it as we can, while still producing good products. It was bound to happen once they got the rights to Star Wars, but like I said, they can still make good products. And since I mentioned Star Wars, yep, I'm talking about Rogue One. This movie tells the story of the rebels who stole the plans to the Death Star, a story that was kinda brushed over in A New Hope, so at first it's kinda cool to see a movie dedicated to it. But in Rogue One, the story isn't as deep as you would imagine. It really is just the Rebels stealing the plans to the Death Star, with a lot, a lot, a lot of talking. To be frank, Rogue One has a lot of things that should keep it off the list. There's quite a few moments where it takes the characters about 10 minutes to say something you can only say in a couple seconds. It doesn't help that I don't particularly find the characters very interesting. Jin Erso is pretty much Rey from Force Awakens, but a little bit cuter. Then again, it is Felicity Jones. Mmm, Felicity Jones. It's the third time that's happened to me already. And I can't even give you everyone else's names. There's that guy played by Manolo oh. from The Book of Life. Have you seen that movie? It's a really good movie, check it out. And honestly, I hope Disney doesn't go too crazy with these Star Wars movies. We're supposed to get a new Star Wars film every year for the next couple of years, and it sounded cool at first, but... After seeing Rogue One, I'm almost kind of dreading it. Star Wars was always like an event. Every time a new Star Wars movie came out, it was a big deal. When Force Awakens came out, it was a big deal. Even when Phantom Menace came out, it was a big deal. They were big deals because they came out years after everyone thought Star Wars was over. So when it came back, everybody was happy. Now that we're getting a Star Wars movie once a year, I'm worried that the feeling of excitement is gonna wear off and people are gonna get sick of them. At least, I might. I like Star Wars, but there's only so much that I can take. So why is Rogue One the movie that bumped Moana off the list? To tell you the truth, it's down to Tarkin and Vader. People complain that the younger Peter Cushing doesn't look that great and is disrespectful to him, but I don't see it. I was blown away by the CG used to bring him back from the dead. It looked just like him, it was scary. And then of course, we have Darth frickin' Vader. I won't spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen the movie, but there is a scene where Darth Vader just takes over the movie for two whole minutes, and it's just glorious. Just to wrap this up, Rogue One was fine. I always found the story of the Death Star plans interesting, and it was pretty much what I thought it would be. It had a lot of nice connections to A New Hope and Revenge of the Sith that helped make it feel part of the Star Wars universe, and I swear, Michael Giacchino is secretly John Williams in disguise. His music sounds so much like the original score, he just captured that sound perfectly. And I should mention, it was a very interesting day because I saw Rogue One on the day of Carrie Fisher's passing. I hate to admit it, but I was sort of expecting it after I heard about her heart attack. That didn't diminish the impact it had on me. It was very sad when she died, especially considering what she went through and how she went through it. The things she accomplished required a lot of courage. The kind of courage that only a real princess would have. Carrie. You were a role model for so many people out there, and you will be terribly missed. May the Force be with you, always. Everybody was Dreamworks is a company that can't seem to decide what kind of movies they want to keep making. 
Sometimes they can make really good movies, but other times they can make movies that are either mediocre or just plain bad. However, in a year that can basically be described as How to Train Your Dragon 3 Can't Come Soon Enough, we actually got something worth a damn. Kung Fu Panda 3. The Kung Fu Panda movies have just gotten consistently better with each film that comes out, basically making it DreamWorks' closest equivalent to the Toy Story movies. The first movie was a pleasant surprise and had a charming story with the right amount of heart and humor, and the second movie took everything from its predecessor and made it so much better. And when it ended on such a fascinating note, I can only hope that it would be expanded on in the third movie. And I was right! Poe the Dragon Warrior, once again voiced by Jack Black, must now become a true master for the Furious Five to train under. While he's being prepared to take on this responsibility, a new villain voiced by J.K. Simmons is taking the chi from legendary kung fu masters and threatening to use it to take over all of China! I mean, China. At the same time, Poe is reunited with his birth father, voiced by Brian Cranston. So it's a story about Poe learning more about himself and his past, while continuing to mature and grow into a more powerful warrior. This movie is written by the same duo responsible for the first two films, and once again they deliver the perfect amount of comedy and drama that helps make these movies so wonderful. It's funny when it needs to be funny, it's dramatic when it needs to be dramatic, it's action-packed when it needs to be action-packed, I think you get the idea. And just like the second movie, it takes what was already established and builds upon it, continuing the story instead of just reusing the same story again and again. I just hate it when sequels feel like they need to be exactly like the first movie. A lot of the directed DVD Disney sequels are like that, and even Toy Story 3 borrows a lot of story elements from Toy Story 2, but you can go to YMS's video on it for more on that topic. So it's extremely refreshing to see a series of movies get bigger and better while having each film stand out on their own, whether it be through the story or the visuals. The Kung Fu Panda movies are all great, but the third one definitely takes the cake. And knowing Poe, he probably ate it too. Did I just steal a joke from a Yu-Gi-Oh movie? Wow. Well. Remember what I was talking about with Marvel movies a couple minutes ago? Well, this year we got two of them, and while Doctor Strange wasn't that spectacular, Captain America Civil War certainly was. I haven't read the Civil War comics, but I am familiar with some elements, and I get how big of a deal it is for comic book fans. After seeing the movie, I completely understand why. The government feels that the Avengers are causing too many casualties. Wait, they're just realizing this now? So they want to pass a law called the Sokovia Accords. If the Avengers agree to sign it, that means they would only take action under government orders. Captain America, played by Chris Evans, doesn't want to sign it because he feels that he and the Avengers should be responsible for how they use their powers. But Iron Man, played by Robert Downey Jr., thinks they should sign it because he thinks being controlled by the government would keep them from hurting anyone else. This is where the drama and the conflict comes from. Not from some big bad guy trying to split them apart, but because of their differing opinions on a very serious issue. And the movie doesn't portray either of them as a villain. Their points are valid and understandable, unlike mine with most of my reviews, so even the viewers themselves are torn between which one of them they want to root for. But you know what? I could talk about all that some other time. Let me give you one big reason why I went to see this movie. It wasn't for Iron Man or the airport fight or even Captain America himself. It was for Spider-Man. I'm a huge Spider-Man fan. I grew up reading the comics, watching the shows, and being terrified by the movies which is kind of embarrassing considering how goofy those movies really are. Butterfingers. Better not lay a finger on my butter. So when I heard that Marvel and Sony were going to be working together to bring Spider-Man into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I knew I had to see this movie. And even though he was only on screen for a total of 30 minutes, he did not disappoint. I'm one of the few people who really enjoy the Amazing Spider-Man movies, so I was a little upset that Andrew Garfield didn't come back. But Tom Holland pleasantly surprised me. He had everything I liked about Tobey Maguire as Peter Parker, and everything I liked about Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man. I especially liked that they showed him six months after getting his powers, so no origin and no Uncle Ben stuff that we've already seen. Yay. Now, would I go so far as to call him the best film version of Spider-Man to date? Mmm, I don't know yet. He was great, don't get me wrong, but I feel like it would be more appropriate to wait until Homecoming comes around to decide on that. For now, I'm still gonna go with Andrew Garfield. I know a lot of people are nostalgic for Tobey Maguire, but yeah, I'm gonna say it, Andrew Garfield was better. Oh, and the movie was good too. Sorry if I just turned this into a big Spider-Man geek out, he was just so awesome. You might have noticed that a lot of movies on this list have either been sequels, reboots, remakes, adaptations, 
sequels to remakes, remakes of reboots, you know, all the typical Hollywood fluff. So, for me, it's even better to know that my favorite from this past year is none of those things. It's not a sequel or a reboot of a remake of anything, it's not based on a book, it's not a reboot or remake of anything that already exists. This is an original story with original characters, and it gave me the best cinematic experience I've had all year. With that said, my favorite movie from 2016 is Kubo and the Two Strings. This movie was legitimately like nothing I've ever seen. It's made by Laika, the same studio that gave us Coraline and Paranorman and the Box Trolls. These guys are incredibly underrated as artists, and Kubo really shows off their skills at their absolute best. And yet the story is actually pretty simple. A boy named Kubo is off on an adventure to defeat the Moon King. Joining him is a monkey voiced by Charlie Theron and a beetle voiced by Matthew McConaughey. So with a plot that basic, what could possibly make this movie better than any of the films I've just mentioned? Well, where do I begin? I guess I could start with the animation. Would you believe me if I told you this was all stop motion? Yeah, as in that kind of animation where everything is made by hand and shot frame by frame. There are computer effects used here and there, but things like this giant skeleton creature and this temple emerging from the ground are all done with stop motion. That is amazing! And the movie doesn't pander to anyone. Most of these newer kids films I've seen don't do anything really creative or smart, they just play it safe with predictable humor and conventional stories and cliches. Kubo and the Two Strings is a movie that takes risks. It's like an 80s kids film in a sense, something really dark and engaging that pulled no punches, but still drew you in with its story and characters. There are no cheats made to assure a happy ending, it's a pure and real kind of story. It brilliantly uses Japanese culture to create its own timeless environment. I love the martial arts, I love the way Kubo tells stories by using moving origami figures. I love the scenery, just look at these backgrounds, they're gorgeous! The theme of storytelling and how everything has to end is brilliantly explored through the perspective of Kubo. He loses a lot of things, including his own eye, but he grows and develops as a person as well as a character. Even the title of the movie is brilliant. Kubo carries around a shamisen that's normally a three-stringed instrument, so you'd think that the title doesn't make any sense, but there's a part of the movie where it gives the title a much deeper meaning than anyone could have given it credit for. I won't dare spoil it for you here. I urge you to check it out yourself. It's brilliant. I've been using that word a lot, I just noticed. But that's the one word that perfectly sums up the entire movie. It's brilliant. Kubo and the Two Strings is not only my favorite movie of 2016, now it's also one of my favorite animated movies, as well as one of my all-time favorite movies in general. My only problem with this movie is that practically nobody else I knew went to go see it. It's really one of those movies that you think about seeing, but don't feel compelled enough to go see. Unless you're like me, where you just were dying to see it in theaters after seeing the first trailer. And I know damn well why this movie wasn't a big hit. Because it's an original idea. We as the general public have gotten too comfortable with seeing things that we're used to seeing. Comic book movies, action movies, 3D animated movies made by Disney or Pixar or DreamWorks or Illumination. When we get stuck in a routine, it's hard to break away from it. So when something different comes around and tries to challenge us, we don't even bat an eye. It's sad, but it's true. I hate the fact that I live in a world where the secret life of pets grossed more than this wonderfully written, wonderfully animated, legitimate work of art. But I understand why it did. Because original ideas just don't get as much attention as those bigger films that come out. Or if they do, then they're mostly by a company that people recognize. We can't do much about it, but what we can do is try to spread the word about films that deserve to be talked about. Kubo and the Two Strings is one of those films that deserves to be talked about. Please, please, please buy this movie on DVD or Blu-ray. Do whatever you can to watch this movie. You will love it. I know I did. That's why it's my absolute favorite movie from 2016. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope I get to see more movies this year to make another list like this for 2017. In the meantime, though, I got a movie of my own to get back to work on. You can follow Progress or check out our other content by subscribing to our YouTube channel. I'll put it maybe somewhere... Oh, yeah, actually, you can click on this light right here. This little light right here. You can click on that to subscribe to our channel, 
And follow us on social media like Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, all that stuff. I, I'm Italian and I like to wave my hands around a lot. That's, my uncle sounds racist. <laughs> anyway, with that said, this is Mark, a.k.a. Mark Lovallo. Bidding you all a smashing farewell. Thank you.